today we're continuing our series on living the Lord's Prayer. Next week, Dr. Joel Hunter is going to be with us. You're not going to want to miss it. Come on, amen. Dr. Joel's going to be with us. And you tell your friends, come on out. He's going to be continuing in the series, talking about forgiveness. Next week's going to be a great, great weekend. I want you to stand with me this morning as we read our scripture verse together. Or if we quote our scripture verse today, together, this is a familiar passage to most of us in the room. This is called the Lord's Prayer or the Disciples' Prayer. I want us all to say this together. Come on, you just say this with me. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This morning, I want to talk to you on this idea, living a life without lack. Living life without lack. Uh, Next week or so, small groups are going to be starting. And I want to encourage you today, if you've never been part of a small group, I I encourage you, take that step. Much of the lack that we have in our Christian walk and understanding of who God is is because we're just not connected with other believers. We were called to be a community, to do life together. In small groups, we connect with one another. We learn to care what our burdens and and share our needs with one another, but we also grow deeper in God's word. And so I'm gonna pray for all the small group leaders. I'm gonna pray for every person that's gonna commit to going to a small group that this next semester, God would bring life transformation to you. Can I pray today? Father, thank you this morning for the wonderful time that we've had in worship. Lord, I just, I don't take it for granted this amazing work that you are doing right in our midst today for the beautiful people that you've sent here. God, people who want you, people that come to church, Lord, there's a spiritual need and they're acknowledging that by their appearance today. And God, I just pray that you will open their hearts. And God, I pray for those who are gonna be in small groups, leading small groups this next semester. Give them the grace and the strength, God, and let their groups grow and prosper and be blessed. Father, I pray for those who need to take this step. I pray that they'll be encouraged to, be pardoned and to join a small group. Bless them today. Lord, for every person that's here today at the sound of my voice, I pray, Lord, that you'll give them a spiritual ear to hear and that you'll give me a mouth to speak. I need your grace one more time. I ask this, Jesus, in your wonderful and mighty name, and everyone said, amen. Amen. You may be seated. When you came in today, you got two things. I want to just really quickly encourage you with these. Hopefully, you pick these up. Uh, Both of them are really important. This one is our daily prayer card. We started our series with the Our Father. We talked about the power of praise and thanking God, just keeping that heart of gratitude and thanking him for all that he's done. We talked about the, the things that identify his character and his personhood by the names the names, Elohim and El Shaddai and, and Jehovah Jireh, all those different things that we, we associate with a character of our God, and we just thank him for being everything we have need of. Last week, we talked about his kingdom come and his will be done, and this prayer card here, there's actually a place for you to, as you're praying through this, you're saying, God, I pray your kingdom, your will, I pray that I'll be in proper position, that I'll align myself to accomplish your will, not my will, but your will in my life. Today, we're focusing on this theme. Give us this day our daily bread. And when you came, if you didn't get one of these, I really really would encourage you to take one of these because we're going to do a little pop quiz. Everyone say pop quiz. Uh, Well, this is about you and only you can answer this question. So I got a few questions that I want uh, to ask you this morning and just, you're going to give it a simple yes or no. Right, each question, there's six of them, a simple yes or no. We've got a little key over here. It's going to help us understand what the yes or no's mean in just a moment. But the first question, the first question uh, that I want to ask you today is, have you complained to anyone this month about your income? Come on. Have you complained to anyone this month about your income? Only you can answer that yes or no. How about number two? Is there anything you want to change about the way you look? And all the people said, amen. Oh, come on, look in that mirror every time, man. I want to sew it back in there. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to be here next week, and same guy. But I'd like to change that. Come on, right? All right, number three. Have you complained about the weather this week? Hey, 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 hey. If you complained about the weather, listen, you live where? In Florida. And it's hot, and it's humid. 
and you're just this side of hell, all right? So own it. Own it. You live in Florida. All right, people complain all the time about the weather. Don't complain about the weather. Number four, have you purchased anything on credit recently that you know you'll not be able to pay by the end of the month? Ooh. Ow. Number five, number five, do you believe your life will really begin when the right man, when the right woman comes along? Do you really believe your life will begin? Number six, do you lose your religion when something breaks or you have unexpected trouble? Ooh, ow, ow, ow. All right, let's put our little key up. Let's see here. All right, if you, score, if you score four to six yeses, you might be an unhappy person today. You might be lacking contentment. You might have lack in your life. If you got three to one, you may generally be content, but there's some areas that you need to grow in. And if you got zero, you and Pastor Esteban and Pastor Glenn can stand up because you guys are super saints. You're the only ones in that room. But for the rest of us, for the rest of us today, all of us have some area of our life that there's lack. Some area of our life that we're really not happy with, that we're not content with. The word contentment in the Bible is just chock full. It's pregnant full of significance and meaning to us. It's got lots of dimensions to it. But I, I got one here I want to give you today. To be content literally means to be free from care because of satisfaction with what is already one's own. Or, or another way to say it is to be pleased. To be pleased. To live a life free from lack. That's literally, that's what it means. To live a life free from lack. Now, here's the challenge that we have. We tend to go to one or two extremes. There's a, there, there's some people who are just content with life, and they're in a very bad place. They're, they're addicted, or they're broken, or they don't have a month to pay their bills, or they got relational issues, and they just, they just can't see any way out. And they become a victim to the circumstances of life, and they have a saying, and they'll say, well, okay, Sarah, it's always been like this, bless God. It's never going to change. It's always going to be like this. All oh, the weather's. I mean, that, that sense of complaint about life. Life is hard. Life is hard. And then you die. There's people who live that way. They're, they're just case of But then there's another side to this. And almost everyone in this room has this. You have a strong desire to succeed. You have a strong desire to achieve. And the potential is when you have this strong desire, it leaves you in a place of discontentment. And, and, and I want you to hear something today. That desire to achieve, that desire to succeed, that desire to, for more actually comes from God. In Genesis chapter 1, the Bible says we were created in the very image of God. And then he said this to the first parents. He said, be fruitful, multiply, and take dominion, literally rule, rule your world, be fruitful, multiply, abound, grow, increase. And where does that come from? There's a desire for that. But here's the problem. When the desire becomes the drive of our life, it's no longer a desire. Now it becomes greed, and it's about me, and it's about mine, and it's about what I can achieve, and it's literally my life and my destiny. It's all about me. And the only way that you and I can balance this, this side over here where we give up to this side over here where we're trying to live out some kind of personal fulfillment is that we say, you know what? Yes, God wants me to achieve. Yes, God wants me to be at peace. But the only way that we can do that is when we live out the mission that Christ has called us, called us for. When we understand that we were people created for purpose, God created you and I for purpose, so that we could be a blessing. When we live the mission for which Christ has called us to, we are people who understand that we can live a life without lack. A life without lack. But to lack means to be in want, to be in need. Our culture today, we live in a world that's saturated with lack. It's not lack of food necessarily, 
I mean, we have food coming out our ears. When you came here today, there were some shelves out there, and Publix had extra bread left over. And, and I see people every week walking out of here with loaves of bread under their arm. We have food in abundance in our culture. Even the poorest among us have access to food. I mean, you could pro- I mean, if you have no food, you could, uh, you're a homeless person, you could probably go to any restaurant in this city and stand at the da- back door, and some chef will feel bad and give you food. I mean, we have warehouses full of extra food, of, of food that's just about to be dated, and, and, and the grocery stores have to get rid of it. We walk through our grocery stores, and we fill up our baskets, and I wonder how often we stop and say, Lord, give us our daily bread. I wonder how often we actually really pray that prayer. Our refrigerators are full. Our bellies are full. But I tend to think that for many of us, there's really a hole in our soul. There's a lack in our soul. There's a lack in our spirit. We look at our culture today. We look at the challenges and relationships and marriages and divorces And then we find people are not getting married today. They're living together because they're afraid that the marriage won't work because there's lack in their life in some area they don't trust. And and so they live together without getting married. Uh, There's a lack in relationships with parents and their children as kids are glued to their little screens and, and they can't pull their head up to have a conversation or they bury themselves in the room in social media and they're lost. Studies are telling us today that loneliness, loneliness is the number one cause of depression for middle-aged men. I just read a study this week that said 18% of young men, adults, have no close friends. Loneliness is a problem. There's a lack. And because of that lack, we, we try to self-medicate. We self-medicate. We do all kinds of things to try to fill the lack in our soul. We have lack in friendships, relationships. We have lack in our relationship ultimately with God. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. When Jesus teaches his disciples to pray, he he starts this prayer with give us. You know what that says? God is saying to us that he wants us to put our lives in a place of total dependency on him. Uh, The way that we live a life without lack is that we keep ourselves in a place of total dependency. That's what we're saying. We're saying, God, I'm dependent on you. God, I need you today. You see, when we place ourselves in that position, we are keeping ourselves from thinking that it's all up to us. Jesus taught this in Matthew chapter 6. I'm sorry. Jesus taught this in Matthew chapter 6 when he's teaching the disciples how to pray. But, but, but I want you to see something. Jesus goes back. He actually goes back in this teaching. He takes the children, he takes the disciples that he's teaching, he takes them back to the Old Testament, to the story that took place in the book of Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, God has a, a people, a special people. They were the children of Abraham. Uh, their great-grandfather was Abraham and Isaac. And God, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and God had told them that these people would be the most blessed people on the planet. And because of their disobedience, they found themselves in slavery. And for 400 years, 400 years, they served the cruel taskmasters. They, be, they built the great pyramids of Egypt. And after 400 years, their cry went out before God, their cry for freedom, their cry to be liberated from this captivity. And God raised up a, mo- a deliverer by the name of Moses. And Moses comes to them, and he's reminded them. They're out here in the wilderness, and, uh, and he's reminded them of the promises of their God. And he says these words to them in Deuteronomy chapter 8. He said, you were, he fed you in the manna. He fed you with manna of the wilderness, a food unknown to your ancestors. He fed them 40 years. They were hungry, and they lacked, and God provided for them. God provided 40 years. They didn't have to work. This, uh, this manna was some kind of like bread-like substance that would appear every single morning on the dew of the ground. And they would go up and they would gather it, and it would just be just enough for that day. Uh, the, as a matter of fact, sometimes they would try to hoard it and, and keep some, uh, have enough for the next day. But that manna would turn to maggots, literally. It, it was just enough for the day. And for six days, they would go out and they would gather. 
And on the day of rest, the Sabbath, they would have enough. God would provide. He said, listen, he says, yeah, uh, for 40 years you were in the wilderness of food unknown to your ancestors. And the reason he did this was to humble you and to test you for your own good. He did all of this so you would never say to yourself, you would never say to yourself, I achieved this. I built this building. I was the one who was successful. I made this happen. I did it. I did it. I did it. No, 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 no. See, the human tendency is to want to take credit for our successes in life. And what I've discovered that when we want to take credit, we either become a hero or we become a zero. We're either the hero in the story or the heel in the story. If it works, if our plan, if our strategies, if our accomplishments, if we feel like we did it and we showed up and we pulled ourselves up by our bootstraps, then we're the hero. I built this company, bless God. <laughs> but if we fail and life doesn't work the way that we think it should, then we feel like a heel. You see, we put so much pressure on ourselves to succeed. And exactly what God says don't do. He said, you'll say, I have achieved this wealth with my own strength, my own energy, my own power, my own ability, my own smarts, my own education. But remember, remember the Lord your God. He is the one. He is the one who gives you the power. He is the one who gives you the ability. He is the one who gives you the power to be successful. As a matter of fact, one translation says he gives you the power, the ability to create wealth. You know why? Because God wanted them to be a blessing. The wealth, the increase was never about them. It was always about God channeling his blessing, his love, his goodness, his provision, everything that he represented of who he was. He wanted to get it to his people, and then he would get it through his people, and they would be a blessing to the whole world. And that's exactly what God wants to do for you and I today. God wants to get it to us so that he can get it through us so that we can live a life of blessing. It's never just about us. It's never about our own needs. We we'll either become dependent or become self-dependent. So when we say give us, what we're actually doing is we're putting ourselves in a position as a child. You know, every child is dependent on their parent. Every little baby, come on, a baby couldn't eat unless their parents gave food to them. A child growing up wouldn't be able to meet their own needs. As a matter of fact, Jesus talked about the reality of heaven and his purposes and his plans in, co in, in correlation to being a child. In Matthew chapter 18, Jesus is with his disciples, and he's teaching them about this kingdom reality. You see, he's teaching about the kingdom of righteousness and joy and peace. He's teaching them about the abundant life, the blessed life. The life that only the Heavenly Father can give them. He says, okay, guys, I want you to understand this is what it's like. He said, it's like this little child that I have right here. He said, unless you change, unless you become converted. In other words, unless the way you change your way you think about who's your source and where your strength comes from and where your power and how your needs are going to be met. Unless you change and become like a little child who just trusts. A little child just knows, they know, they believe, they have complete confidence. My boys, they're 24 and 29, and when we go out to dinner, they're 24, they're adults, and they have complete confidence that every time the check comes, <laughs> dad's going to pay the bill. Come on, dad's going to pay the bill, because that's what dads do. You have a heavenly father. Come on. He knows what you have need of. Unless you become like a little child and say, God, give me today. God, give me what I need. You'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Wow. You will never enter into a life of peace and joy and fulfillment and purpose and meaning. You'll never enter that kingdom. Never. This is so important. This concept of dependency means like we're like a child. We're taking self off the throne of our heart, and we're allowing God to rule at the throne of our heart. I love this one, this one guy that I'm reading. He says, in our relationship with God, he said, we're all like infants, hitchhikers waiting for grace, beggars in need of a handout. To be human is to be in need. All of us here today have need. 
All of us in this room have something that we can't fix. A relationship with a child. Come on. Uh, some issue at your work. Uh, 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 maybe a marriage issue taking a place in your family right now. Maybe it's financial provision. I mean, Jesus is speaking materially. He is th- speaking about daily bread. Oh, but it goes way beyond that. Maybe we have thinking. Maybe we have addictions. I mean, all of us in this room have some place in our life where we are in need. And God does that. You know why? Because it keeps us dependent on him. So how do we do this life without lack? The second thing that needs to happen, and I lost my little blank. The second thing that needs to happen, put that right in your little blank. The second thing is, is that God wants us to live a worry-free life. Live worry-free. Give us, God, I'm dependent this day. Not tomorrow's bread. Not next week's bread. Not next month's bread. But give us this day. Everything we have need of. What do I need today? Lord, I need you today. (laughs) In Matthew chapter, chapter 6, in this Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is teaching the people. He's not only teaching about prayer, he's teaching about this kingdom life. He says, don't worry at all about having enough food and clothing. Why be like the heathen? Why be like the pagan who get themselves all twisted up in a knot and get get themselves all bound up or they have to self-medicate? Don't be like the heathen who are worried about the economy every day, who are worried about where their food are going to come from. Don't be like them, for they take pride in all these things and are deeply concerned about them. However, read the next verse. Your heavenly father already knows. You're his child today. You're a king's kid. You're a son or daughter of the most high God who created all, made all, knows exactly what you need today. Your father knows perfectly well that you need. He knows what you need today. He knows the relationships that you need. He knows the friendships that you need. Come on. He knows the provision that you need in your personal life. He knows the addiction that you need to be free from. He knows everything about you. And he will give them to you if you give him first place. You want to live a life without lack? Everyone say no lack. You want to live a life with no lack? You give him first place and live as he wants you to live. One translation says, and he will give you all you need. He didn't say he'll give you all your greed, all your excess. He said, I'll give you all that you have need of. Living a life of akuma matata. <laughs> Come on, akuma matata. Living a life of no worry. So don't worry. Don't worry. August 16, 2016, there was a study done. It was printed in the Psychological Healthcare Magazine. It listed the top five things that people worry about. F- top five things that destroys your contentment and peace. Number one was money or lack of money. We all could have guessed that. Number two was worry about the future. World conditions, terrorism, the economy, the environment. Number three, relationships. People worry about their marriages. They worry about their kids. Listen, we all have this. And my son drove home from school the other night, and he drives down from Gainesville. And I got to tell you, the moment he told me he was leaving at 930, and it's dark, I get a little pit kit in my tummy. He's 24 years old. He's a man, but I'm a dad. I want to worry. That's my natural tendency. It's our natural tendency. We worry about our health. A doctor's report. We worry about jobs. Someone once said that people live their lives crucified between two thieves. The regrets of yesterday on one side and the anxieties of tomorrow on the other. This concept of worry literally means to be torn apart, torn between two decisions. Two decisions. Our body's over here. Our mind is over here. And the result is that we live in tension. We live in tension. Corey Ten Boom was a very famous evangelist through the 50s and 60s and 70s in America. She was a woman that had experienced the Nazi Holocaust. She'd survived it. It's an amazing story. But I love what she said one time. She said, worry does not empty tomorrow of its sorrows. It empties today of its strengths. It empties your today of your strengths. And here's the problem. When you worry... 
when you take on unnecessary cares, unnecessary burdens that you were never meant to, never meant to carry or never meant to wear. You know what? It's absolutely useless. It's useless. It's pointless. Jesus talking about this very topic. He said, listen, in Matthew chapter 6, verse number 27, can any of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? Is it going to change your reality because you worry? What I've discovered about my God is that my God is not moved by my frustration. What moves the hand of God in my life is my faith, my confidence, my complete trust that he is a good, good heavenly father. Someone said amen. Come on. Come on. Oh, we can't change. Jesus said it's useless. What are you going to do? You can't change anything. You can't change it by worrying. Worry is unbecoming to you, a child of God. You're a king's kid today. You were built, created, destined by God to be an overcomer. When we fail to see ourselves the way that God sees us, when we fail to trust God, we become what Craig Grishel says, a practicing Christian atheist. We believe that there is a God. It's, nobody has to argue out of our minds that God doesn't exist. We know that he's real. But our hearts tell a different story. We have a difficult time trusting that God is going to meet our needs. And so we live life on our own. We try to figure it out our own. We try to do it ourselves. And so how do we overcome this? This day. How do we trust God this day? How do we do that? The first thing that you have to do is you cannot buy tomorrow's problems today. Refuse to do it. Refuse to buy tomorrow's problems today. Jesus said, live one day at a time. Don't be anxious. God will take care of you tomorrow. God's going to take care of it. Don't worry about it. You can strategize. You can plan. But don't worry about it. Don't carry it. My wife has been an excellent example to us as a family. She's had multiple challenges with cancer. And and I shared with you guys last week that we're here. She was diagnosed just a couple of weeks ago with cancer. And and it's really just, again, brought this whole reality of who our source and who our trust is in our family. Friday, she received a doctor's report, and, and at the bottom of the report, there were these words, worrisome. It actually was on the doctor's report, worrisome. I'm like, wow. I mean, when I, got to, when I heard it, I mean, you get a doctor's report, and you know that you've got cancer. They've already diagnosed it, and then they had the word worrisome at the, at the bottom. I, you can criticize and judge, but my first thought weren't, weren't happy thoughts. Come on. Oh, the joy, yeah. I had to make a choice. I had to refuse to buy tomorrow's problem today. And you know what? Immediately, we just stopped right then. I, I was, I was uh, down studying. I was at a, my hidden location <laughs> studying for today's message. And we just prayed. And we said, Father, you're good. I immediately turned my prayer into praise. I begin to tell God how good he's been to us and begin to thank him. And here's the deal today. The doctors have a worrisome report, but our God has another report. It's the report of being healed. Come on. Come on today. Someone give him a praise in the house. Folks, but this doesn't happen overnight. It takes training. It takes training. I memorized this verse recently with a couple of young guys in my neighborhood, and we're doing a small group Bible study. And the verse is 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 and through 9, and it talks about don't have anything to do with godless myths and old wives' tales, but rather, rather, and, he say, and then Paul says, you know, physical exercise is good or for some things, but training yourself for godliness is good for all things. Training yourself to be godly, to think right, to live kingdom life, to trust God, to give us this day. Training your mind, because it starts here in the mind before it gets to the heart. But you begin to train yourself for godliness, which has promise. It has promise. It's a promise, both in this present life and the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying, worthy of full acceptance. Train yourself to be godly. Let me give you a little example. This, this is just, this is a fresh one. This happened last week. Last week, uh, I did my first 5K. That's 3.1 miles. I remember when the guy in the, this guy in our church, Doug Wife course, 
tens first service. He challenged me to do this. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, are you, like, you know, then they have these little apps now, from couch to 5K, like in four easy lessons, you know. So I load the app, and we start, I start working on it. And, and fortunately, I had been in this kind of zone. I'd been working on losing weight, and I did the Weight Watchers thing, and that was helpful. And, and I started running, and the very first time I ran, I got the 2.2 miles, very first time, 2.2 miles, and my right knee gave me a bad word. <laughs> My right knee wasn't going to participate with that run any longer, and, and it was some pain. And I realized that this is, I'm going to have to train. If I'm going to do this right, I'm going to have to train. I'm going to have to exercise correctly. And, and I began to read about how to do that. And so over the last, next several weeks, I began to run and run and, and begin to grow in it. And I thought, three miles, wow. I mean, one mile. My age ran at one mile. That's one thing. Two miles, but three miles. And, and then he starts casting vision for a half marathon. I'm like, are you kidding me? Let me just get the three, you know what I mean? And so last Saturday, I showed up at a race down in uh, Orlando, and I want you to see this picture here. This is me over here on your right. Can you see that picture over there on the right? I'm crossing the finish line. Now, let me tell you, I crossed the finish line, but I promised myself after I saw that picture, I'm never crossing a finish line looking like that again. <laughs> My next finish line, which is coming up in just a couple weeks, it's going to be one of these. <laughs> I'm going to have the biggest smile on my face. But I want you to see something. This is really what happened. This is a photo, photo finish line image here. This brother right I don't know who this guy is, but he's number 1224. He came up from behind. That last tenth of a mile, he saved his energy, and he came up. And I could hear somebody coming up behind me, and he, this joker passed Doug and I at the finish line. <laughs> Now, I want you to see, now, Doug, he's the runner. He's run, I don't know, 20 marathons, and he runs, you know, he rolls out of bed, and it's a five-mile run kind of thing, you know what I mean? Look at him cross the finish line. He's like, waving at everybody. His wife's over there, Laura. Hey, guys. Yeah. You know what he's been doing? Doug's been training. I just started. And some of us here today, we're just starting in this journey of faith, and you're training and you're learning, and you're growing, and that's okay. But what God wants you to do, God wants you to learn to t depend totally on him. Totally, come on. And then you just take one day. You take, come on, take today. Don't buy tomorrow's problems. The next thing you have to do, so you don't buy tomorrow's problems, and that's a choice that you make. You choose to train yourself for godliness. But the second thing is you have to learn. You have to learn to give God those problems every day. You have to learn to give them to him. Give them back to him. Do you not think he is big enough? Do you not think the God who spoke the worlds into existence? Do you not think the God that Jesus said when the birds of the air fall to the ground, he hears? Do you not think the God who made it possible for the creation itself to self-regenerate and take care of itself. Do you not think that God is able to take care of you? And Peter, talking about this reality, he said, cast all your cares. Come on, say cast all your cares. <laughs> cast all your cares, all your anxieties, all your worries, all your fears, all your concerns, once and for all, for he cares about you. Your heavenly Father cares about you with the deepest affection and he watches over you very, very carefully. Do you believe that today? Amen. Give us this day, today, akuma matata, no worries. Come on, I just watched that, but that's good. That's good, baby. Because ultimately, what you have to believe is that you, he is, we use the word faith, but I like to use the word trust, we trust in his full sufficiency. Give us this day, no worries, our, our daily bread. Daily. All over the world, people eat bread. Go to Italy, focaccia. You go to France, they have these bouquets like this. America, we have Wonder Bread. <laughs> Everywhere you go, right? Bread's a staple of life. It's ordinary. You're every ordinary to life. Give it to him. Oh, he's sufficient to meet all of your needs. 
Every care, every burden, every way. Emotional, psychological, relational, yes. Yes, financial, yes. All of it, but it's way beyond that. Don't get stuck just on the money. Don't get just stuck. That's just such a small way to live. God wants to meet all of your needs. All of your needs. In John chapter 6, Jesus has just done a miracle. It's an interesting miracle because one of the greatest miracles of the Old Testament, beside opening the Red Sea, is one of the greatest miracles, and we read it in Deuteronomy 8, was that he provided manna for them. 40 years. 40 years, these little, some kind of wafer thing was it was sweet. They ate it every day. They seemed to like it, and they got tired of that. They complained about getting the bread every day. They wanted something else, and they said so they wanted meat like they had back in Egypt, but in Egypt, they never really had meat. It was just a lie. They were living a delusion. He sends them meat. He says, okay, you want meat? Here, who says, you want meat? I'll give you meat. I'll give you so much in your grocery stores, and I'll give you so much uh, in your Costco's and your Publix and your Walmart's. I'll give you so much food. You throw it out and put it in dumpsters. You don't even feed the rest. I'll give you so much, but I will send leanness to your soul. Oh, and we live in a country that has so much leanness, so much brokenness, so much pain, so much meism and about me and self. No. He's our sufficiency. And Jesus had just done a miracle. It was a miracle of bread. He took a little blood, he took five loaves, a couple little fish from one little boy. And he took those took those loaves and those fishes. And he broke it. And he broke it. And he blessed it. And it multiplied. It fed every single person, every man. 5,000 men, that means there are women and children, could have been 10, 12, 15,000 people. Every single person got food. Every single person got what they daily needed. They ate fish every day in their culture, and they ate bread every day in their culture. Give us this day our daily, what we need for today. And they got it. And then they said, whoa, 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 whoa. Look, give this, this, let this, let this bread, give it every day. Oh, you want it every day? You want this bread every day? Okay. This is what you do. You start off. When Jesus took that bread, you know what he did? The Bible says that he took the bread and he blessed it. He blessed it. And then he fed him. You know what I've been talking the last couple of weeks about? Every time you sit down at a meal, either by yourself, which is kind of awkward. I was at the little restaurant the other day by myself eating a salad. And I just bowed my head and prayed and I saw this girl looking across at me. I don't know what, you know, but... You got to do it. You got to break your own uncomfortability with praying in public. And and I bowed my head and I thanked the Lord because I recognize today that everything I have comes from him. I'm dependent. I need him. I need him today. I hope you do too. Don't live full of pride thinking you can do it. Don't do that. It's a great mistake. Many people make that mistake and they have leanness in their soul. And they took it and he broke it. Multitudes were fed. And then he says this to them in Matthew chapter 6. Put that verse up. Put the Matthew chapter 6, uh, uh, John chapter 6 again. The bread, put the bread verse. There you go. And Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whew. You want enough for every day? Make Jesus, make Jesus the bread of your life. Make him your source. Make him your strength. Make him your helper. Make him your Lord. I am the bread of life. And whoever comes to me will never go what? Never go what? Hungry. And whoever drinks of my life will never go thirsty. A life of no lack. No lack emotionally. No lack relationally. No lack physically. No lack spiritually. No lack financially. Come to me, take my bread. Oh, not this stuff. This is going to perish. But his life that's eternal, it's forever. It's reality. (laughs) And then later, not that long later, maybe a year, year and a half later, it'd be right before he would be crucified. Right before he'd be drugged through the street and mocked and spit on and beaten, made a public shame. Right before, right before the Roman guards would place a crown of thorns upon his head and blood would drip down over his brow into the ground. Right before he'd be crucified on a sinner's cross, he would sit down and eat one last meal. And once again, once again, it was about bread. Once again. 
And he said, listen, he said, listen, folks, remember what, remember what our Father in heaven did a long time ago for our forefathers when they came out of Egypt? Remember how he provided manna for them? That's what we're doing here when we're at the Passover table. Man, remember how they, they would take the lamb, that innocent lamb, that firstborn, and they slaughtered and they took the blood and they posted it over the do- doorpost of their home. And every person that had the blood over the doorpost, that, that death angel that was coming that night to kill every firstborn in the land of Egypt, that death, they were, de- uh, that death angel would pass over them. Remember that? Mm-mm, that's me. That's me. He said, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of who I am, of what I did. You had a cup. Hopefully you received a cup. If you didn't receive a cup like this when you came in, our ushers are here. She's waving a bucket. Hopefully a couple other ushers. If anyone needs, just raise your hand. There's some people here that didn't get them. Some people over here. I would just encourage you today, if you don't have a right relationship with the Lord, you can get right right now. This is a great place to do it. But if you haven't made a decision today to follow Christ, this is for believers. This is something that's very spiritual and very sacred. For 2,000 years, believers have done this. We've gathered together. And the Bible says that they did koinea. It was such a powerful thing for the early church that at their very beginning, they would do it every single day, every time they gathered together, every time believers, and they gathered together every day and they would encourage one another and they'd pray for one another and they'd read the scriptures to one another and they would do this, exactly what Jesus said. As often as you do this in remembrance of me, take and eat. For this is my body, which is broken for you. I want you to take this little piece of bread right here. You know what this represents for you today? This represents his life. He's your source. This represents today that you are dependent on him and only him. He's going to meet all of your needs. I want us to take just a moment, and I want you to close your eyes, and I want you just to thank the Lord today. I want you to thank the Lord for being your daily bread. Lord, give us. We're, we're children. We need you today. We thank you that you provide everything I have need of in every dimension of my life. You are the bread of life. Jesus, you were that bread that came down from heaven. Whatever happened that night, Lord, I don't know what happened in that room, but that power, that reality of that exchange that they took that night when they took that Passover meal, it was so real that for thousands of years, believers have done this as an identification of being in a relationship with you. Whatever happened that night, whatever reality became real, you, the bread of life, become our bread today. Father, I acknowledge today that I have lack in my life. I have times, Lord, that I've worried or feared about things that I shouldn't worry about. Lord, I I have times in my life that I haven't thought right thoughts and haven't trusted you, and I ask you to forgive me. Like David of old, God, I said, search me, O God, and see if there be any crooked way in me. But create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit today. Jesus, I thank you that as we as a church family, we take this bread We eat of it today. We're identifying with you and your life. And we say thank you for being our source. Thank you for being our sufficiency. And in the name of the Father, and of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, we now break the bread of life. Let's break the bread and eat together. And in the same manner, the Bible says that Jesus took the cup. There was an old covenant. There was an old way of doing things blood of lambs and bulls and goats no longer folks no longer sacrifices that the Jews would make in the Old Testament times would no longer be sufficient to cover your sins would no longer be sufficient to provide access to the relationship with the Heavenly Father it was now only through the blood of Jesus you see every drop that went to the ground every, every, every bit of blood that poured off his back he did it for you The writer of Hebrews says, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. And Jesus gave his life so that you could have life. Exchanged his life for your life so that you could become in right standing with God today. That's why he did it. He loves you. There's something powerful in this cup. It represented the forgiveness of sin. 
death is no longer got a hold on you. You're now a child of God. That resurrection power, reality of everything God is and, and who he is to us today is available for us today because of this blood. Just one drop. Just one drop forgives all my sins. Just one drop forgives all my diseases. Just one drop makes me whole in his sight. So we take this cup today. We say, Lord Jesus, the night you were betrayed, you took the cup. And you said, uh, as often as you do this, do this in remember, remembrance of me. And so we drink of this cup in the name of Jesus. Let's receive all that he has for us today as we drink together. His name is Jesus, Holy. our Savior's Christ. Holy Spirit, right now in this moment, I come and bring healing. The bring some vision, say, bring Come on, let's stand together at the church. His name is Jesus. Come on, let's stand together. 